So can our experiences, our memories, and even our behaviours be influenced by the way our ancestors lived their lives? Welcome back to Myth Monday. On a rainy August afternoon in 2012, budding footballer Rory Curtis was unfortunately involved in an accident which placed him into a coma. This article from the BBC's own website claims that Rory woke from this coma speaking fluent French, something he hadn't been able to do before the accident. In fact, the article also reports that the nurse attending to Rory was herself a native French speaker and was so taken in by Rory's French that she inquired what part of France he was from. The answer, of course, is that he wasn't from France at all, but the Curtis family did originate from Normandy in the 1800s, leading to the claim that Curtis's brain had somehow accessed knowledge from previous generations. Now, my gut reaction to this is that it's probably total bullshit. But is it really? Well, yeah, it probably is. Especially given the fact that he had studied French in school and suddenly stopped speaking French after just one short conversation. However, due to me researching that story, my YouTube feed started throwing me up some quite interesting videos and it wasn't long before I realised that there was a video worth making based on this story. So today we're going to be looking at the ideas of genetic memory, inherited behaviours and even reincarnation. In his book, Children Who Have Lived Before, author Trutz Hardo recounts a tale of a three-year-old boy who claims to remember being murdered with an axe in his past life. But not only that, this boy claimed to be able to lead the villagers to the site where his remains were buried and when they got to that site, they found the remains of a human skeleton that had been killed using an axe and they also found the murder weapon. And the story gets even more compelling as the toddler was able to point out the murderer himself who then confessed and was convicted of the crime. So we'll get back to that story later on in this video, but for now let's begin with what is already established science. Are the behaviours which we all exhibit just because of the way that we're built or the way that we're hardwired if you like? Well the answer is yes, they're called innate behaviours and here's an example of how just one of them works. When you place your finger into the palm of a newborn baby's hand, he will hold your finger. Very much like newborn baby monkeys who when they feel a branch in their hand will grip onto it, therefore reducing the chance of them falling out of a tree. Reflexes like this are governed by the reflex arc. In this case there will be a stimulus, which is a person's finger, felt by receptors in the skin of the baby's hand. This causes a nerve impulse to be sent via the vertebrae into an effector or a muscle in the baby's hand causing it to close. You'll notice here that the brain isn't involved in this decision making, it is only informed post-event. Now notice there I said that the brain is only informed post-event, it's not actually part of the decision making process itself. I remember once doing some work under my kitchen sink when I heard a loud bang in the house and when I heard that noise and jolted up, I split my own head open on the bottom of the kitchen sink. Now nobody would consider that a rational response, nobody would think to split their own head open in response to hearing a loud noise. What's going on there is this reflex arc is acting as fast as possible possible to get me to move as fast as possible to hopefully get out of the way of any danger that might be present. But that's not the only type of stimulus response that we see in nature, we see them everywhere. Here's another example. For example, when herring gull chicks are exposed to the stimulus, which is a spot of a colour which contrasts against its background, they will peck at it. And the stimulus of being pecked on the beak causes the mother to regurgitate food to feed the chicks. Tindenberg did a great deal of work on this showing which combination of colours provided the best stimulus to cause the chicks to peck and it's even been shown that a simple dot on a lollipop stick will elicit the same response. Now the reflex arc is just one mechanism that results in innate behaviour. There are other types of innate behaviours that we see and this next clip will see me just run through a few of those and that will be my last word on that type of behaviour before we move on to something a little more disturbing. Kinesis is a change in movement caused by a certain stimulus, but this movement tends to be random, non-directional. For example, wood lice, when they experience temperatures that are too high or too low, will simply speed up their movement in the hope that eventually they'll find somewhere that has a more suitable temperature. Taxis is a more directional response to a stimulus. For example, sperm exhibit chemotaxis, in which they will locate the egg by following a chemical up its concentration gradient. Paramecium exhibit galvanotaxis, which is a directional response towards an electric current. Our friend the woodlouse also exhibits taxis when it comes to light levels. Anybody who remembers doing simple choice chamber experiments like this at school will know that woodlice like to follow a decreasing gradient in light intensity so they can find somewhere nice and dark. Tropisms are exhibited by plants and they are a growth towards a stimulus, for example, phototropism in the shoot of a plant. 
The tip of a plant produces a hormone called auxin and this is responsible for elongating the cells at the tip of the shoot. However, sunlight breaks down auxin which means it's always the cells on the part of the plant which is facing away from the sun which will elongate more, causing the shoot to bend towards the sun. Geotropism is a movement towards the earth and in the roots of a plant it's also regulated by auxin. However, in the roots, auxin inhibits cell elongation, so as gravity pulls auxin down to one side of the root, the cells on the upper side are the ones that elongate, forcing the root to go downwards. Now we all know that as we grow older and we experience more, we can learn more and we can choose to modify our behaviours, but what if the same is true of our entire genome? What if our genetics itself can actually change based on the experiences that we put ourselves through? Every cell in our body contains exactly the same genetic information, so why is it then that some cells express genes which makes them ideal for living in a liver, and some cells express genes, for example, which make them more suited to be part of a muscle or the eye? As you might have picked up from the visuals, the answer lies in the term epigenetics. The epigenome is a collection of chemical compounds, physical structures, which help regulate gene expression. As a result, by determining which genes are and are not expressed in a certain cell, the behaviour of that cell can be controlled. Now it turns out that our own epigenetics and therefore our very own gene expression can be affected by our environment. Okay, so it seems that our lifestyle choices and the environmental factors we expose ourselves to can affect our epigenetics and therefore the way we express our own genes. Fine. But what if we could pass those epigenetic changes on to our children? That would mean that our children's lives are affected not just by their own DNA and not just by the way they choose to live their own lives, but also affected by the way we've chosen to live ours. In 2017, a study was carried out to demonstrate epigenetic memory in the nematode worm. The nematode worm used had been genetically modified with a gene that would allow it to fluoresce. This gene was not expressed at lower temperatures, but when raised to 25 degrees, it was turned on. The amazing thing was though, that after the gene had been turned on, for the next seven generations, it remained turned on even at those lower temperatures. In fact, the study showed that if the nematode worms were placed at an even higher temperature, let's say 27 degrees, the gene would remain switched on for 14 generations. This is direct evidence that gene expression in offspring can be directly affected by the environmental factors placed upon their parents. Now, if you're anything like me, I don't interpret that as good news. I think we all like to think that we're in control of our own destiny. I think we all like to think that if we do the right things, we eat healthy, we exercise, then we're going to live a long and healthy life. None of us like to think that if our grandparents have made bad choices, such as smoking or drinking too much or overeating, etc., that we should be paying for it. But evidence is mounting that that just might be the case. This paper here studied second generation offspring from women who were pregnant during the Dutch famine. So the F1 generation here shows the children of those women, while the F2 generation shows their grandchildren. The study showed that adults in the F2 generation through male offspring had significantly higher weights than BMIs than expected, while no such results were found in children from F1 generation women. Anyway, two down, one to go. We've looked at innate behaviours as being inherited due to the way that our body is designed or hardwired, if you like. We've looked at epigenetics as being a mechanism of sorts that allows us to pass uh, experiences on from one generation to the next. But what about the reincarnation story from the beginning of this video? Is it really possible to pass memories on through a more spiritual mechanism? Well, as far as the story from the beginning of this video, that book was written by somebody called Trutz Hardo, who is Germany's best known regression therapist. And that doesn't make him a neutral researcher by a long way, not in my book anyway. Now, I spent seven hours trying to track down the finer details of this story on the internet, and they just are not out there. Now, unfortunately, that did seem to be the case with all of the really fascinating stories that I came across. The stories themselves were really, really easy to find, but digging deeper and finding proper documented history surrounding them seemed to be a much more difficult task. But still, I suppose a good story always sells a book, doesn't it? Um, but wouldn't it be great if there was a, a proper scientist out there, a methodical, well-respected scientist who'd spent over four decades of his life researching this phenomena? Well, meet Ian Stevenson, a psychiatrist who worked for the University of Virginia School of Medicine for 50 years, and at the tender academic age of 38, he was appointed chair of the Department of Psychiatry. Now, Stevenson spent over four decades researching children who claimed to have memories of past lives. And although his work was largely ignored by the wider scientific community, he was never considered a crackpot. He was always considered a well-respected scientist. And because of that, he's an excellent source of properly documented cases. And here's one of his best ones. 
A toddler in Sri Lanka was overheard by her mother talking about the day she had died when she was pushed into a river in a town called Katargama by her brother. She claimed that her father was a bald man called Herith who sold flowers for a living and that they lived next to a Hindu temple outside which people would come and smash coconuts on the ground. Not only that, but she claimed the family had dogs kept in the backyard which were fed meat. Now all of those claims were made to Dr. Stevenson, I have no doubt about that whatsoever, but how well did they hold up when they were fact checked? Well it turns out that there was a flower vendor in Katargama whose daughter had drowned in the river when playing there with her brother, but there was no allegation that she'd been pushed in. However, her father was not bald, but some other members of the family were, and her father was not called Hereth, but her cousin was. Now did they have dogs in the backyard? Well yes, and did they feed them meat? Well again the answer is yes, although I'm struggling to think of anything else that you would feed a dog. Did they live near a Hindu temple? Well the answer is yes, but again that's not an uncommon thing in Sri Lanka. But what about the smashing open of the coconuts on the floor outside the temple? Well it turns out that this is part of something called the Tamil festival and that this will be a commonplace activity outside all Hindu temples. So considering that's one of Stevenson's best cases, it's not actually jam-packed full of correct specific information. There's lots of general information there that will apply to a lot of people, you know, for example, having dogs and remembering to feed them. But when it comes to the specifics of people's names and appearances, we tend to go a little bit astray. There's not really anything in here that I would say makes me think twice. Also, it's really not helpful that in some of the most impressive cases, the children claiming to be reincarnated actually already knew friends and family of the deceased individual. Anyway, maybe you can change my mind. Maybe you've got stories of your own or you know people who've got stories of their own that you could put in the comment section and I'll happily look at them and I'll happily get in touch and I'll happily make a follow-up video. But for now, what I'm not going to do is call these children liars. I really do not think that's what's happening here. And neither does this man. In 2006, Professor Peters published this paper here in which he tested two cohorts of people. The first cohort claimed to have memories of highly implausible events such as past life memories, while the second cohort did not. Both groups were shown a list of 40 names, some of those names being famous, some not. Then after a period of time they were shown the same list again but this time with additional names added, again some famous and some not. Both groups were then asked to pick out the famous names from the second list. But the group who claimed to have past life memories were far, far more likely to misidentify non-famous names that they'd already seen in the first list as famous names in the second list. And just as importantly, they did not make that mistake with the new non-famous names added to the second list. So essentially, people who claim to have memories of past lives are far more susceptible to lose the context in which they acquire previous information, and that can lead to the building of false memories. And if you've seen previous Myth Monday videos, you'll know that once a memory has formed, it can change and it can grow, and it can become something that feels very real, even if it bears absolutely no resemblance to anything that's actually happened in the past. Now, I am interested in listening to more reincarnation stories, so please do put them in the comments section. But for now, the original question, can our genetics help pass our memory on? I think that's been answered and the answer is yes, but just not in the way that the original story that started this video might have implied. Bye bye. Now just a reminder that in the real world I am a real teacher and if you're looking to provide some extra support for friends and family who are still at school at a lower cost than hiring your own personal tutor, then please consider my Patreon. Any pledge of any amount will allow you to request revision videos for science, maths and astronomy that I will place on my educational channel which is linked in the description. Anybody who's on tier 1 will be able to message me with any questions on any of those subjects and I'll make sure that I'll respond within 24 hours. And in addition to that, anybody on tier 2 will have access to online lessons run via Hangout where you'll be able to sit and ask me your questions on a one-to-one -one or a small group basis. Now please be aware that there are absolutely zero perks for anybody considering signing up just to support the Baldy Cats or Conspiracy Cats channel. That just isn't necessary. This patron is all about the tutoring service.